So um, I just want to say thank you again, Yoshi, for sparking this interest in this in this topic of how to go online and how to make the most of Zoom. So no, thank um, you for I doing just this. wanted to no, it's it's our it's my pleasure. Just wanted to ask though, just I have some agenda or some ideas of what to share, but I would really prefer to begin always with what you guys want to know. So if you wouldn't mind in the chat, if there were some specific things. I put down some ideas that I gleaned from, um, from Yoshi's email, which had to do with um, how do you screen share to get the best um, um, recordings um, from the screen sharing and sharing presentations. Uh, the other thing had to do with uh, personalizing the room by, by with you know, making sure everybody's got their names or the ways that you um, to talk to people. Like you say, hey, Terry, make sure you turn on your camera so we can all see each other. And we can take advantage of something that Yoshi also shared with us um, earlier, which was this fascinating idea that social contagion is really spread much faster when people see each other's faces. <laughs> so, uh, and also when, when the teacher can actually see their, their own. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing there as well, right? Um, and also there was this idea about, does everybody know how to set up breakup rooms? Because it's not intuitive. You have to do that in the settings. And so there's a handful of things that I, had in mind, but I did want to hear from you. So if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat um, the things that you want to prioritize so that we make sure that we do do that, right? So Miriam says, just any old thing, no idea how to start, let's just go. So great. So Terry, glad that you're here. Terry, if you do have your camera, it'd be great to also see you as well. That would be um, very helpful. Um, and Amanda, so you're interested, are they telling you, Amanda, that they, are, they want you guys to go online as well soon? So kind of interesting, we're already been online. So I already have like um, stuff set up in Canvas that I didn't create, but my class, I have three classes and I would say 50 to 70% of my students, um, their, work has, their work schedule has changed. So we want to kind of, give an opportunity to do some modification um, because, um, you know, we, we can't, you know, we don't want them to drop out, if that makes sense. We don't want them to disenroll because their standard of living has significantly changed and their time to study. And so we're going to do kind of a little bit more of a transition like you did yesterday with us. Um, so I want to kind of learn how to do that. If that makes sense. Okay, so part of it is also finding the flexibility of what we can and cannot do online and how it can be used um, after the fact, right? There's sometimes um, it's really important, at least for our class, we care very much that you guys are able to rewatch the entire class. Sometimes we, we about half the people actually do rewatch our entire two hours and go through all the notes and the chats because stuff is happening simultaneously. It's hard to get your head around all of it at the same time. But other people are um, doing this because they're looking at using, how do you actually flip? So could you flip a classroom and people, you know, you can do this from your phone or could you actually use the recording features in Zoom to flip classrooms as well? So there's multiple reasons that people want to go into to doing these things. So, okay, I get it. So you're, you've not been asked to do this yet, but you, are, you may find a change in policy um, that's going to push you to to actually get online and so you'd like to know all the, right. the right. availability so that part okay. and then there's another part about like all the mental health resources and stuff that cannot they can't go on campus anymore because of campus yeah. so it's kind of like that part too so which okay. was kind of secondary but i okay. want to be able to do it if i need to like you got know. it okay great thanks amanda and victoria um are you so you're more curious about what your teachers are going to do than, <laughs> so you're wondering, will my teachers all of a sudden become amazing because they're all going to have to teach online? Is that what you're asking? I'm looking at the chat. It's kind of interesting here. <laughs> what, do you, what are you yeah. thinking? I was actually thinking to do some projects here back home in Russia because um, what I know that schools don't really um, flip the classrooms, let's say in my city, what they do is they just do, they give uh, homework. To, to students to do it completely by themselves and then they just send it to teachers and then they give the answers so there is no studying um i was just wondering why is it the case so and in most cases like from what i know they just don't know how to conduct it and our teachers are um don't know these technologies so, uh, that's why i'm here <laughs> okay 
Great. Uh, your curiosity, it's, it's really welcome. There's, um, I just want to make a, just a bit of a clarification. When we talk about teaching remotely or when we talk about being online, there's this really big spectrum of different kinds of courses that we're talking about, right? And on one end, you'll find something where you have these one-off webinars where people want to have hundreds or thousands of people be able to hear somebody else and then you filter some kinds of questions here and there and it's very low on the interactivity scale right then you get these things which are like MOOCs you have these massive online open courses they don't have price tags they don't have deadlines really very little interaction with people okay those are not what we're talking about here okay what we're talking about here has to do with online um, courses and I would divide them at least into two levels of, of, of courses some are people that I know are just barely making it, barely figuring out how to get online, and they're just, just using it as a repository to upload things and pretend they can have their face-to-face -face class in a new modality. And that's just wrong, but anyways, many people are doing that because it's a space to hang homework or receive things or do a quiz, but it's not really maximizing the potential of that platform. And then you have classes like ours, right, Tabitha, which are really cool where we have to, we're trying to leverage as far as we can the technology to make this a much more personalized uh, experience. And we, you know, use the breakout rooms and we do other things. And it's a different way to think about online education. And so um, that's what I want to talk about more. I'd like to, we have an opportunity, this huge catalyst right now of, of the virus, unfortunately, but something good is going to come out of this. I have already heard, for example, from my, um, my daughter at Tufts and from another ex-student who used to be in this class, who's also taking, uh, now the classes are all online, who just told me, it's inc I said, how was your class, your first class? And they said, it was amazing. I, d I think that putting the teachers online has made them also improve their pedagogy. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Well, they were told, well, remember to pose questions beforehand. If you can flip so that you can have a deeper discussion, use the breakout rooms like this. Things that they had never done in real life. They'd never done small group work before. They'd never asked students questions. All they did is lecture. So all of a sudden now people are being shoved into this new space. So it's a really beneficial thing. So what I want to do to start off and to get uh, straight to Yoshi's um, first question and then we'll look at all the other ones that come up and if you guys have things do put them in the chat. Um, you guys notice that down in the middle of your screen you'll see that there's this green arrow that says share screen. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing share screen and it, I'm sharing my entire desktop. So that's the one thing that that's a big deal because sometimes mm -hmm. if you just share a document or one thing at a time, then you're not going to be able to see everything. So right now you see that I've got my mail open, the thing I sent to you guys, I've got the chat here, right? So the main idea here is that I'm going to minimize everything. And I just want to show you that when we have a presentation, okay, so what I do, because the screen that is recorded is the one that is shared. So it doesn't matter if you have an assistant, like sometimes, um, so Danielle, I'll say, Danielle, can you start the recording? It doesn't matter who starts the recording because this account goes to our cloud. So it doesn't matter. Before, two years ago, Zoom was in a very strange place and we were trying to goof with all kinds of things. And we would always say, the person with the best internet should be the person who records. It doesn't matter anymore. It absolutely doesn't matter who starts the recording, okay? Um, so what I do, is on my screen is the one being shared. So what I did is that I took you guys, I sort of drag you into one half of the screen more or less, and then I'll take the presentation we might be doing. And if you see in the PowerPoint structure, you see where you click on slideshow, it, there's something that says set up slideshow, okay? If you click on that and then you say browse by an individual window, the second button here, that will allow the slide not to take over the whole page when we open it up, but it will allow us to just, when I start it, when I go here to do the presentation, it'll just do that one at a time. And so mm -hmm. what I normally do is that I resize that. And what's cool about it is that it saves all the transitions and all the other cool stuff. However, I'm going to add a tip here. Some of these things are tools and some of them are just tips and some of them are just sort of like a, uh, you know, after experience, we realize some things are important to do and that's what we're going to share. One thing here is I love my PowerPoints because I spend a lot of time doing transitions and things come in and it makes movement and we can circle stuff and, 
add things as we go along. And it's, it's a different way of doing it, right? But in other, um, to, in order to have that kind of a movement, I need to have a PowerPoint. That takes a ton of bandwidth as compared with a PDF, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you are projecting from a space that has poor bandwidth to begin with, you may just be better off just taking your PowerPoint, right? And I'm going to save it and you decide you're gonna save it as a PDF and you just present the PDF. The PDF has to also be just dragged and resized. So that's the bottom line. Basically, that's the, the, those are the two ways that we go about presenting our things um, to you guys. So it's just a matter of resizing because a PDF is a much smaller document than the PowerPoints are, but you don't get any transitions. But once it's opened, you do the same thing of resizing. I'll show you here. Let me see, where did it put it? I don't know where it put it. See. What's the difference <laughs> of the transition? Like, why is that valuable? Oh, I just like it because I think it looks cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's nice to be able to have the slides, you know, to, to have one person, like I'll put up, remember when we talk about your discussion boards and sometimes I'll do, one person at a time and not the whole group is uh, you know listed so if you do a pdf it looks like this and you have to scroll it okay but it is less bandwidth it's not as pretty and there's no transitions so if you have the bandwidth go ahead do the pdf the the powerpoint so yoshi that was your first question wasn't yeah. it did that did that answer that um yes 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 and then also you put a uh, chat window yes uh over this right so the, so the chat is just something that I can pull up and then you can also resize the chat oh, wow. any way you like, right? Now, what's so interesting though, is you don't, if the reason you're doing it is for posterity's sake, for the recording, don't. Don't worry because when you are, when you get back your recordings in Zoom, you will find that it's already embedded. Your chat and the transcript will be on the right hand side of whatever was on your screen. So you're gonna get what the screen is, which to us is the people and the presentation. And just off to the right, you will see, um, I'll show you one of them just so you get a sense of this. But what's so, so you don't need to put the chat if you care, if, if all you're doing it for is for the recording. Does that mm. make sense? That's so, more for the live. Um, Yes. So, so if I'm just, yeah. So this one, let me see if it's this right, is the right recording. I'm just going to record. No, this one doesn't this see it. Any, any. Okay. So do you see how this goes right here? Um, I'll, the screen that I had set up with the people oh, yeah, 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 and the yeah. presentation yes, yes, yes. and on the right, you will get the audio transcript and the chat transcript is already going to be embedded in your recording. Okay. Outside so of you the don't, screen outside so you don't even have when you're recording yourself you don't have to even think about where do i put the chat now because it's not all going to fit but don't worry that will be put up there later the other thing to take advantage of yoshi i don't know if it's in your context if it's important at yale right now but these what we have our uh what we can do and what we can tell we, when we have students before in harvard we used to have a lot of students with a much lower level of English because there wasn't a, a TOEFL requirement. Now we don't have that problem and everybody is fine. However, what's really cool about this is once we've downloaded it, oops, <laughs> sorry, when we download the, the whole recording, we can upload it to a YouTube channel. And once you're in YouTube, you can do translations automatically. Um, so mm -hmm. I think we shared that, uh, you can share that with your students. We don't do it for our students, but we, um, uh, we, we tell them how, if, if we think that it's a need, like if they're second language learners. So if you are in a, a presentation in YouTube, what you do is you see down here, it says CC. Yeah, yeah. So CC, if you click on that, it automatically gives you close caption. It gives you the subtitles. But if you choose what you can do, I'll make this bigger so that you guys can see it easier. Instead of the CC, next to the CC, you see this wheel for settings. If you click on that, and it's right now, automatically the close captions, the subtitles will be in English. But if I click on it and I say, I want subtitles, and I want it to be, whoops, and I want it to be uh, auto-translate, 
then I can choose any language I want, okay? So mm -hmm. I can choose uh, Belarusian, okay, R Belarus. So now, is this, uh, I don't know if you can, re you can read Cyrillic, right, Victoria? I don't know if this is any good, but it's a translation. Yeah, so, I can so, understand a bit. <laughs> okay, so the idea here is um, you can take the recording that Zoom will give you after the fact, and in addition to having the transcript, the other, th the request that we've made to Zoom and they're working on it, believe it or not, is that once we get this, that the transcript would be automatically translated. We're trying to get them to do transcripts in real time and translations and recordings. And they're like, okay, we're working on it. I don't know what they're, I don't know how fast that'll happen. But in the meantime, you can use YouTube, okay? So one one follow-up question yes. on this uh -huh. is mm -hmm. just as you did the PowerPoint, you can just maximize it to the size of the window, right? Yes. Can you uh -huh. do the same thing for the YouTube video too? When Absolutely. You, when you yes. click the uh, bottom right box of the YouTube, that will actually take up the entire screen, not the window. Right, right here. So the yeah. same thing can happen within the, with, with the YouTube video. It's right. this one, right? Yeah, and then, right. And then with the same thing with the Zoom, you can do exactly the same thing, right? It just takes up your whole screen. But then you don't get to see the, the transcript part, right? That's right. Okay, so... so so can we do this YouTube video just as we did with the um, PowerPoint? The um, YouTube. Oh, oh yeah. So you're asking? No, actually, what I did yesterday. Remember when I showed you a video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, I just let it take over the whole screen like that, okay. right? I just clicked it to be the whole screen, mm -hmm. um, because it's in part the what I find very important um, is to share our slides and see you guys. But right. if I'm going to insert a video into the middle of our class, like we had yesterday to sort of talk a bit about grit and have that one minute thing, I, I just let that take the whole screen. And when it's recorded, it will just be that that took the whole screen. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Okay. So okay. that's, that was your main question. And I, and I, and I didn't, I said, let's, let's do something for everybody, Yoshi, because I'm pretty sure it's not going to just be you who wants to know this. Yeah, I mean, this so, is great. Um, okay. So other questions, let's think about other things that you guys might want to um, talk about, or even tips um, that you would say, um, I see um, both Drew and Danielle are here, things that you guys, um, you might want to, to ask us about how over the years, it's taken a while to sort of figure out how we're going to do this, but it ends up being a pretty decent system, I think. So, um, Geraldine, did you have a specific question you wanted to get at um, about well, this both whole Carl, thing about yeah. online? Yeah, both Carla and Danielle are being helpful. It's when you, like, let's say you're sharing a presentation like you do, but and it's taking up the whole or it's taking up a lot of the screen and you pull it out. So it's not taking the whole screen, but you make it big, but then you pull up a word doc that you're reading from to sort of go along with your slideshow. Do they see that word? Yes, doc? they do. Okay. <laughs> so not you, good. Okay. Okay. Also, the other thing is just try, try this, Danielle, send me a private message in the chat. Here's the problem. Nothing oh, is private. <laughs> Nothing is private. Okay. So if she sends me a private message in the chat box here, to you, I, you guys, it's on the screen for everybody. Okay. So you guys have to be very, you know, careful about how you're using that. Um, the but, other thing but within yes. share screen, you don't have to share your entire screen, Gerald. Right. So you can, so when you open share screen, um, it will, uh, give you a, a window with choices and you can select only your um, Google Chrome or only your PowerPoint and there are cases where you would want to do that so that you know maybe you have something else going on simultaneously or a message you're waiting for or something then you could do that and then they won't see the the silly you know meme that your spouse sends you <laughs> right the thing is when you when you sh when you immediately share it takes over the whole screen so that you can't re you can't drag in or open some other document that's no, but, yes. she's, but Daniela is clarifying that when you do, when you do, how, how about we do this? I'm going to stop sharing and you guys all look at the, you see the middle bottom where it says uh, mute video and it also says share screen. You see where that is right there? When it says share screen, that little green arrow, if you click on it, you'll see there's multiple options. 
The one that we typically do when we're recording is the one that says share desktop, right? But there's other ways that you can only share a single document. Is that what you were getting at, Danielle? Your um, yes, but I think Geraldine is asking a follow-on question, which is like when you share, you, Tracy, share your screen, on my screen, it sort of takes over my entire screen. And if oh, you push, right. right, you know, so if you push yeah. escape, Geraldine, mm -hmm. then it will make the thing that Tracy shared with you a little smaller so that you can do other things. Tracy, yeah, I, I would go that's so exactly That's exactly it. And then you can also, you also, you guys should always just resize and put whatever you want. I, I know that some of our students, when ever at the beginning of our presentations, remember, we always try to drag the PowerPoint into the chat, mm -hmm. right? Some people just simply look at that full screen and just listen to us the whole time because they know if they need to, they can go back and see other things. Other people try to keep their eyes on both things. Some people get totally dizzy seeing two sets of people. So what you can do in your own thing is that you can literally, right now you can try doing this, right? If you do what Danielle said, push escape, so that goes, it makes it smaller, but then you can also drag and move it to make any size you want. And if you wanted to, you can drag us totally out of the picture. Does that make sense? So everybody, that's the other cool thing about Zoom. Everybody gets to set up their desktop the way they want. Uh, and, but they need to be reminded they can do that because it's not intuitive to know that you can mess with that screen. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I cut somebody off who was going to add to that. Who was that? Was that you again, Danielle, or was there somebody? I think asking? maybe it was Amanda. And when she's done, I have another comment as well. Amanda, um, are you? Thanks, Danielle. Uh, Tracy, can you just do a quick, um, like, I'm, I'm numbering what you're saying. So one, you share screen. Two, drag students into half the screen. I'm just, I want to make sure that I have the sequence, because um, I'm going to be doing this later today. And so I'm okay. so glad that. So I just sort of set this up to give you guys a bit of the screen space there, right? And then I will, I'll minimize the chat, right? So that that's not in our face or whatever. And then I will look at what we had was, was it this one? What was the last one we did? This one, um, a PowerPoint that we had. Remember that I told you that once you have your PowerPoint open, you should go to your slide show, set up the slideshow. Make sure you choose browse by an individual slide. Because if you don't do that, it does take over your whole screen, right? Browse by an individual slide, the second button. And I say, okay. And then when I start, when I just push present at the bottom here, when I start my slideshow at the at this bottom part, just start it, only one will come up at a time. And then I drag that to where I want it so it fills up that screen, okay? And if you've got a chance to do it right now and play with it, and if you bump into something, let us know. Danielle, what else were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say at the top where right now it says you are viewing, there's a green bar that says you are viewing Tracy Tokohama Espinosa's screen. To the right of that, it says view options. If you click that, that gives you on your own desktop or laptop some choices for how you want to view what she is serving you. So the size, um, do you want side-by-side -side mode, which changes how you see the um, classmates and some things like that. So um, I think the main problem, the, the benefit of all those things is that the main, we set up our screen so it's the best for filming to have the recording. And that makes some people dizzy because you're going to see yourself twice. So what most people should take the time to do is organize their screen the way they want to see things by dragging portions th of things off uh, or minimizing the whole thing and just showing the presentation that's dragged into the chat the way we do, right? So that's all up to you guys to, to pass on to the people who are going to be using the screens so that uh, to be using Zoom with you, okay? Um, how, so is that okay for the filming part of it? Because Yoshi, that was one of the biggest concerns is how do you end up having a video where you can see all this stuff? Well, you only need to see the people and you need to see the presentation. That's at least what, what we are prioritizing because we really think it's vital that, we, that everybody can see each other and everybody can you know, interact in that way. So, and then automatically the transcription and the chat will be on the recording when you get it. So you don't have to even drag that or mess with that. Sometimes I do make it big 
when I say, you know, so what do you guys think about this? You know, how many of you are bilingual and what languages did you learn your language, whatever it is, and we wanna share that, I will share the chat. But normally I keep the chat minimalized because it will already be recorded, okay? Okay, so some other, yes, okay. Other questions, Yoshi for, and, and Amanda, you guys have pressing needs for classes today and tomorrow. What are some other questions you had about um, maybe how we go about doing this or we can start throwing out ideas and you can stop us if can you, you. Can you tell them how they record? Because it does not automatically record and then you do have to do some setting changes, I think on the back end to make sure it goes where you want it to and yeah, what happens So there. if you guys notice that on the bottom here, can you guys see my bottom toolbar here where it says the thing about chat and everything? Well, here is where, and this is where you get the sense of who is doing what. So I can, if you click on manage participants, what I see is that I came in first, I'm the host. So if Drew had come in first, he actually ends up being the host it, because, because Drew, Danielle, Cynthia and I are equal entry points. And so whoever's in first ends up being the host. We change that sometimes depending on uh, the needs. And I'll explain what a host can do and what co-hosts can do. Any of us can record, okay? And what you see at the bottom there, right now we are recording. You see the button that says pause, stop, and record. When you click on that uh, initially, it'll give, you a, it'll give you several choices. The one to choose is record to the cloud, okay? If you accidentally record to your computer, you will probably not be able to turn your computer on again <laughs> because it's so heavy. After two hours of recordings and video, it's just too heavy um, for, the, for your computer to handle. So you record to the Zoom cloud, which is typically the account that's set up by the institution. Okay, so that's how you start it and that's how you stop it. Big thing to realize is that we're gonna talk about breakout rooms a little bit. Breakout rooms to date are not recorded. Um, they can be, if you are the host, the host can record the room they are in by pushing record again, but typically breakout rooms are not recorded, okay? The other thing to remember about breakout rooms then, so if you see down here, the more button, we get a bunch of choices. The more is just because I'll close the participants so that we can see this. Breakout rooms, if I click on this, it allows you to set up either manually or um, automatically a number of rooms. So based on the number of people that's here, I'm trying to put this where everybody can see it. So it's, I can choose that, okay, there's 12 people here and I can put them into four room, uh, three rooms so I get four people in every room or I can put, make four rooms and have three people in every room or I can make five rooms and have two to three people or six rooms and have two people or whatever it is, right? Or I can decide, wait a second, I really got to make sure that Tabitha is in the same room as Geraldine, right? And I go to create breakout rooms and then I can assign them. So I assign that I want to have Yoshi and Carla in one room and that I want to have Geraldine and Amanda in another room. And then I want to have Tabitha and Terry in this room. Do you see what I mean? So you can do it by hand, but to be completely honest, it takes a lot of time. And like, that's what we made Drew do yesterday because here's the other point. When you have more than one breakout room in a session, the first one will automatically put people in rooms and it looks like it's just total random. It's actually based on the order they entered the room. So, and when they come back again and you do a new set of breakout rooms, half of those people are gonna be in the same room again. So unless you manually redo a second breakout room, you're gonna end up with similar small groups. And if you really wanna mix it up, you'll have to have at least the second breakout room has to be done manually, or the first one has to be done manually. One of them has to be done differently, or you're gonna have similar people in those rooms, okay? Now, how many of you are using, are you guys gonna be using breakout rooms? Because um, you need to know that in your account, in Zoom, um, you all should, I don't know if you've, uh, I'm not sure what the status is of you guys, but when you're in, uh, the, in your own account here, so I can go, uh, you'll see that this, these are the meetings we have set up and those were the recordings that we had, right? You see that? Well, unless you go to settings and you scroll all the way down to open breakout room possibilities, 
it doesn't matter what deluxe account you have, you won't have that option to have breakout room, okay? So we have turned on the options to have polling, to have chats, to have the whiteboard, to have all these things available. But the breakout room is somewhere way down here, I think it is. But unless that button is clicked, you will not see that option, okay? Does that make sense? I don't know where it is right now, but just so that you know, you know you have to go to settings to actually turn on the breakout room, okay? Is that okay? I don't think people on an iPhone oh, here it is. or a tablet here it is. can be in a breakout room. I, I think there's some different um, privileges. Um, and so just be aware of that because we've had students a few times who were having trouble with their laptop and logged in on their phone and then they end up in the room with me, you know, just sort of staying in the main room and, and I figured out do, later that there was do a you have Do you have um, Zoom on your phone, Danielle? Um, I do, but I'm saying when a student, you want to test it? I just want to test it because I don't know that that's true because we've had plenty of students um, be on their phones, haven't we, Drew? And we do put them in breakout rooms, I think. Although I, I've, you're right, it, it could be that there's some different things, functionalities, yeah, but I, I think, think everything you can do on the computer, you can do on your phone, I think, I don't know. But, um, but in any case, just I'll test it out the, and figure it yeah, out. I know I'll that, also try to log in. Right yeah, now I know I had that issue with. You'll try to log on your phone and then we'll create a breakout room. We'll see if we mess you up. Okay. <laughs> so just so that you know, in order to be able to have this functionality down here, to be able to create a breakout room, in order to be able to have that functionality, number one, you have to be the host. That is one thing that a co-host can't do and you can't have anybody do that. So sometimes if I get in here first and I need Drew to create the breakout rooms, I then just make him as a host, I can make anybody else co-host, right? So I'm gonna make Drew host, okay? And I change that and I become now nothing. I have no status, which also means that in my shared screen, I also do not see the option of creating a breakout room anymore. Do you guys see that? So I no longer have that. So only hosts can create breakout rooms. Okay. So that's a, a big deal. Hosts so I am now logged in. I'm logged in on my phone under the Harvard, uh, the 1609 account. And I believe Danielle, are you also in as a, a second account? I'm not. No, once I saw okay. that you were doing it. If we so, wanted to so try. Drew, Let's try it, but let's make you, can you make somebody else, can you make Danielle host or, or me host? Well, I, I'm, so I'm on two accounts isn't... right now. I know, I don't, oh, okay. Okay, you're in is Harvard now, okay. Okay, yeah, so um, so you're the host, so you're gonna have to create the breakout rooms, mm -hmm. sorry. I'll create some breakout rooms and we'll see what Just goes create on. it and we'll be gone for less than a minute, but I just want okay. to see if the functionality of on a phone is, is true, okay? Thanks for letting us experiment with you guys. Okay, so when you, he creates the room, everybody's gonna have to accept and go to that room to be pushed into the room. So join the breakout room and I'll see you in about 30 seconds. Okay, and I can join. So I just did join. Okay. Hello? You can be there, okay. Okay, so I can, I can end the rooms right now, um, but I am You're here. Muted. Oh, You're muted. I, I can, I, I am here on my phone and I am also in the main room. So, yes. Well, it's just because I'm using my own account for the um, hosting privileges and I'm using the Harvard 1609 account as this uh, other thing to test uh, as my phone. So okay. yes, phones can go in. Okay, phones can go in. Close can you just shut all the rooms down yeah. from, yeah. from the one yeah. that's in the other room? Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. <clears throat> so, results of the experiment. I can't report because I had to take a call while so it was yes, going on. Um, result of this is that yes, as a, a Zoom app installed on a iPhone, you can enter a breakout room. I am having trouble manually closing out all the rooms. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, I think it's weird that the other guys didn't come back because I guess they didn't jump back in like we know how to do it because we, mm. all of you guys have been in breakout rooms a million times and you know how to either wait out the minute or you know how to jump back in. And we jumped all, we all jumped back in and they didn't. So their minute is going to have to expire. Give up yeah. And then they'll, yeah, then they'll, after that, they'll be back, pushed back in. I did not weird? choose anything though, because I was trying to respond to that phone call and I just was put back in the room. So I'm not sure. Well, so then we need to figure out, because we've had several times where students were stuck in the main room, and I was told that it was because they were on a different type of device. So we need to figure out um, why that happened. So, so here's, the, here's the, okay, hey, so that was be. a good experiment that we can say with clarity that if you're on a phone, you can still be in a breakout room. And Drew was in the breakout room, and everything worked just fine. So, yeah, Yoshi? Um, uh, Drew, Drew, go ahead. Just one thing. Um, that it was done with the Zoom app on the phone. Now, if okay, someone so does not have a Zoom maybe app that's what it was in through the Safari browser or something I bet like you that. that's what it is, Drew. Okay. Yes. okay, so that's something for you guys to share with your students, that if they do download on their phone the Zoom app, then they can participate fully in, in the breakout rooms, no problem. If they are entering through, like they go through Chrome and they go zoom.us and then they enter their account and then they enter the number, that's not going to allow them probably being on the, the URL of Zoom doesn't get you in, but being on the app of Zoom does get you in. Okay, so have them download the app so that they can fully participate. Sorry, Yoshi, you had a, you had a yeah, comment? Yeah, so question? yes, a question. Uh, so when uh, typically in, in this class that you run breakout rooms a couple of times in, within one session, right? And in yes. that case, do you create the breakout room in advance before you start launching the breakout room? And so that you save the setting uh, I mean, I understand you can only set up the breakout room after everybody's on, uh, like, you know, on board and so that you could cr create. But as soon as you know, you now know how many students are there, maybe five, 10 minutes into the session that you have like a 90 minute session, maybe you can ask the TA to start creating those breakout room as I'm talking. And so that when it gets to the point that we can just launch it right away instead of then the TA has to spend a couple of minutes to, like, you know, to create the breakout room. You know what I mean? It, never, it doesn't, it shouldn't take actually a couple of minutes. Literally, it's, if you do the automatic one, it takes yeah, you it's random. seconds. It takes you literally open, create breakout rooms. How many right. people do I want in a room? Push. It takes five seconds to create, uh, to get, which yeah, is amazing that, because face to face, it would take you. 10 minutes to get everybody, you know, okay, so you guys go into that corner, you guys go into that corner. It's much faster. But when you have to do it manually, manually, um, yeah. definitely, um, at least uh, you guys, uh, you guys tell me, but um, how much time do you think is, is good to give another person a heads up before you have to set up the rooms, Drew? I would say if you're trying to be intentional with what you're doing, not just changing it up, like, so it's not the same as the automatic, really trying to have some intention, right. uh, five minutes. Five minutes. I so mean, me I, as an instructor, just to give them a heads up. Okay. The only way to handle this is just to give them a heads up a couple of minutes before I really want to have that launched. The other well, thing you can we... go ahead, Danielle. The other thing you can do is do um, automatic and then change it. It will it'll populate it, and then you can just sort of manually move, move the things that yeah. seem oh, sort of okay. off, and that sometimes is a fast way to deal with it. And if we're still on this breakout room question, um, it is important to know that if someone gets bumped and they come back in to the Zoom platform, they will enter into the main room. So they will not right. enter into the breakout room that they were in. If someone gets bumped, if someone comes in late. Now, if you are the person that is operating the breakout rooms, you're the host, uh, then you will receive an audible ding and that will say, it's a distinct ding, and that will show you that something is happening. It'll be a little bubble, red icon with a number on it, in, it where, in the bottom third where it says breakout rooms, and you will see that there is some action that needs to be taken, like someone is unassigned and needs to be put into a room because of God knows what, technical failure. Just the only other thing to, to add to that, Yoshi, is that, I don't know if you know this, but we, we meet every week and we talk about students, we talk about what we're going to do. And also we all try to be there like 15 minutes before the class yeah. starts. 
And I always tell them, you know, there's going to be one breakout room just about 15 minutes into the class. There's going to be another one in about an hour into the class. You know, who's going to set up the rooms? And then that's, it's already set before. So it's not, we usually don't do it on the fly. But I mean, it, it, you could do it. Like you could be talking and say, and we're going to have a breakout room in about five minutes. So please, you know, TA be ready. But usually we've already got that um, yeah, yeah. shared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the thing about how we film and that's kind of how we do breakout rooms and kind of the, all the little things uh, about breakout rooms. Were there any questions about those two aspects? Because there were a handful of other things we wanted to talk about, um, maybe some ideas that I think um, were important to our course. And I don't I know if you know I think Victoria has a pretty good question with um, presenter that? notes. Um, it's uh, presenter notes or what, what do you call them, talk notes? Talk track. Uh, talk track, yeah, but presenter notes, like when you present and you want to see the notes, maybe some people prefer I don't. to. And I, don't, yeah. I know that that's a thing, but I never, I don't use notes. And so I know that that might be a problem. Like Geraldine was saying, what happens if you have like a, your, your, your word thing on the side that's telling you what to do or the presenter structure, you can set up the PowerPoint, but it will show everything when you're sharing the screen. I would so, say if um, you wanted to maybe have a, um, a PDF of some notes yeah. that you would, I mean, it wouldn't work per slide by slide, but if you just had a general set of notes, you could have it on your phone, mail it to your phone and have that open or something, keep it off of the screen. That would probably be my first step. I'm not sure if you had a second screen option altogether, that's what I would do. You and could if you do don't that. want to have slides, uh, let's say it's a math class and you want to draw like on the board or for your students, can you actually do that? Of course, yeah. So if you see on the bottom where it says share screen, instead of sharing the screen, you'll see that it says whiteboard. So you can share a whiteboard uh, structure instead and then you can say Victoria, right? You can share whatever goes on there, right? So it, it um, <laughs> I'm not very good at this. <laughs> so you can use your whiteboard and do that. You can also, the cool thing about whiteboards is if you do things, you know, you're better off, you know, type what you need to here and share that. But if you did need that, or you can erase these things, right? But um, the cool thing is if you did put something like a special formula and you wanted to save it, you can download and save whatever was on the board if you want to then clear it off to do other things. So. Definitely, um, you can do the you can do the whiteboard for sure. And I suppose if you were really pr going professional, then you'd have like a Wacom tablet or something like that that would then be able to do anything um, of that nature, where you'd just be able to basically I illustrate. Yeah, but that's a whole okay. other addendum. So those are um, those were the filming things, and those were things about um, the breakout rooms that we wanted to talk, and, and also how you can share things. The other things that we that came up with us and that I think you guys, we're super lucky that we get to have Drew and Danielle be with us and to have people on the chat simultaneously. Um, Harvard permits us that past 25 students, we could have a second TA, um, which does give us this, this luxury that we can always have somebody on the chat. And one of the things that you guys know about all learning, it requires Miriam it, uh, attention and memory. And if you don't have attention and memory, you don't have learning. And one of the real problems, Carla, with being online in this setting is that stuff happens and then you think you heard something and you want a clarification. And was that Baki Rita? How do you spell Baki Rita? And if you've got somebody on the chat who's got their finger on the pulse of what's happening and they're knowledgeable like these guys are, they're picking up on that and they are satisfying that immediate attention. I need to have that question answered before I can now go on and think about anything else. So rather than wait till the end to ask questions or interrupt the, the class in a way that you think is, it might be bothersome to other people, you get it clarified on the chat. And I cannot stress to you how I think important and helpful that is, even though it might sometimes seem like a parallel universe, like what we're talking about and then somebody will have to say, oh, so sorry, I was just, I was typing in the chat and I didn't hear that last question or something because it is um, asking your brain to, to divide attention. 
And so we, we struggled with finding this, this balance that we think the chat can be beneficial if it's used for clarification. And we really motivate you guys to get that out there and finished and get it out of your system in the chat. Um, but it really takes uh, it's uh, this this art. I think it's a it's a real art that um, that Drew and Dandel bring to the chat to sort of make that conversation not detract, but be very complementary to what's going on within the system. Right. So that's something that we wanted to mention about chats. Other observations about chats that you guys want to to make or to ask about. Um, Danielle, with what frequency would you say that people, because I sometimes remember, and I don't always remember, to say, is there anything on the chat we need to be talking about? And sometimes you guys say, before you move on, like you just said, Drew, uh, Victoria had a good point here on the chat. With what frequency do you think that should occur, that, that you're reminding whoever's presenting to, to, make, to pay attention to that space? Our chat is very active, you know, more than some other classes, I'd say. So I think um, if you are not going to have someone who can really be somewhat dedicated to that, um, then you probably have to either carve out some space halfway through and maybe again at the end to, for the primary professor, you know, the professor to go and see what's there and answer some questions. Um, otherwise, I think it's a little bit of a function of how many students are in the class and how active they are on the chat. And some of it may be because we are responding, then people go to the chat to ask a question. Um, yeah. You know, but I but, think that's good because just for what we all know about the brain, you guys, if you're not paying attention, you're not learning. And so, but you can't pay attention when your brain is saying, you know, what, what was that guy's name again? Or she mentioned that book or why was that important? Or what was the name of, or how do you spell? If that's hanging on in your head, you're not going to be focused. So this chat plays a really important role in making sure that there's immediacy of clarification. So just wanted to, to mention that as well. I would also I say, you know, it's a bittersweet kind of thing because I, I, I can quite easily stop paying attention to what's happening in the class to focus on the chat. Um, well, I, I this, this, is, this is where we have to find this really interesting balance because, <coughs> Tabitha, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about this, but we cold call a lot. And I don't know if that scares you or if it's helpful. Go ahead, <coughs> Tabitha. Well, I was going to mention, um, you know, what are some of the suggestions you might have for students who are trying to juggle this balance of the chat and the watching the video because I know I've been doing this for years and I still can't manage it because I'm constantly distracted by that chat flashing off and there's no setting that I can put where I can disable the color of the chat or some alert of it um, and I will say that I think cold calling is particularly helpful um, because it forces me to pay attention in classes that I might not otherwise. And so I think that's an invaluable uh, tool to, to use. And I think that that's something that many teachers are almost afraid to use in, uh, initially. <clears throat> They're so worried that the class rhythm will be thrown off by asking a question that somebody might not answer correctly, that teachers don't talk to, don't bring everybody into the conversation. One of the things that one of your classmates really helped me see and use much better was, um, she said, I, I really get nervous when you just call on me. Um, can you do, the, can you help me by giving me a heads up, a teeny heads up just before you say something? Like we'll say, this concept of neuroplasticity is phenomenal, Tabitha, because it's really one of those things that's more recent that we've just realized in human beings that we can document. And I'm not sure, you know, what you would think about, you know, this impact that it's had on education. But, and then I sort of give you a few, uh, uh, almost, um, uh, you know, a 30 second lead time knowing that I'm going to say, and what do you think of that? Um, however, having said that, I've also been very mean sometimes when I know somebody is doing other things. I'm just going to call on them because they just need to know they need to be in our space and present. And I know that sometimes that I, I don't mean to do it as being mean, but I think that everybody in this class adds so much when they're there. But if they're going to be, you know, distracted in something, 
I'm going to do my best to haul, haul them back in. And so, um, but you guys will also see that if you use the breakout room strategically, then it permits a much better participation afterwards. So if people are prepped with the ideas in a smaller group, then when brought back to the bigger group, it's easier to share. So maybe the order of those kinds of things is also important. I think Amanda made a good point, <clears throat> excuse me, in the chat, which is that it also makes you feel like the, you're part of the class and you're part of a community. So in the very beginning, it might be a little bit like, whoa, the person just called, called on me and I wasn't expecting it, but it helps create the community piece of it since we're not in the room physically together. Um, and we've all been in so many classes, whether you were in the room with someone or not, where you just felt like the professor didn't know your name. <laughs> and so um, I think that that's one of the things that that um, teaching style or sort of choice really adds. Can I add to and that? Sure, Can I add to please. that? Danielle um, and I um, were in a class on campus and it was, I think about 55 people in the class. And um, I, I, I don't think that there was this much engagement in the class. And this is an online class here thousands of miles away. So I think that's pretty fascinating. My first flip class ever. I almost didn't want to do it because I don't feel real techno technology savvy, but Danielle said she would help me so <laughs> with technology. So thank you, Tracy. Thank you guys. Uh, no, I'm glad that, that it seems to work for you. Go ahead, Carla. I, I just wanted to say the same thing and I've been talking to someone this afternoon about, you know, using Zoom and, and, and sort of uh, classroom engagement and because they were like, oh, well, you know, this is way too hard and people will just not engage. And, and so I gave this class as an example because for me, this is one of the most engaging learning experiences of my life. Um, and um, um, because of the way that the class... <laughs> The class works and the way the cohort is gelling as well and Geraldine just posted you know how much embedded learning we're doing in the breakout rooms and I think that's just getting better and better as the week weeks go along because we are forced to engage with one another and we seem to be doing it rather well um, and so for me that's that's the real value of this class and, and actually in a way I'm sort of um, closer to my cohort in this setting than I was in cohorts when I was a university student where I had, had didn't have that proximity of, of sen or sense of proximity at all. There's, there's, a, he, there's a lot to be said for the online setting. And I think, Yoshi, you helped us understand this a little bit better in one week when we were talking about it. Uh, in a face-to-face -face class, you are almost never face-to-face -face with most of the class. In this class, you are in everybody's face. You are literally seeing the faces and in addition, you're also seeing your own face. And so that just adds to the, the social contagion that is possible, which is another point we're going to get into. But Marion, you wanted to say something. And I also wanted to ask you something very particular about um, names. Being called on by name, and, and does that make a difference, do you think? Go ahead, Marion. Okay. Well, I'm way past the age of brown nosing, so what I'm saying is from the heart, it's not for, um, it takes a special kind of person and it takes a special type of energy, which you are busting at the, all of you, Drew, Danielle, are busting at the scene with energy and enthusiasm, and the class could either be a disaster, or depending upon who runs it, or it could be the most wonderful thing, which is what you've turned it into. So I think that anyone who would try to emulate the process would have a very difficult time at the beginning. And I think a lot of Harvard professors have to put their egos in check now when they try to, uh, to teach online and see that, hey, you know, this, this is kind of hard and these students have to be super motivated super intelligent and um how are we going to get that same type of enthusiasm in our classes i just think That's it's a rude awakening and maybe when we walk at graduation you know they'll give us an extra round of applause <laughs> and, the professors, and the professors who teach again well, i'm, I'm too old for brown nosing <laughs> <laughs> but let me put it, this into a context, which I think 
I always say to know is not enough. You know, you know stuff, it's not enough. However, I think there are some things you need to know, and I'm pretty sure most professors don't know this. Social contagion is real, and the intensity of social contagion is even stronger, according to Mayer's work, online than it is in face-to-face. -face. I mean, we can't smell each other, but we can certainly, you know, con are contagious in the way that we are with each other. And one of the things that um, it should be known by everybody is that what that teacher walks in and does and feels and, and projects becomes the mood of that class. And so if you've got somebody uh, lethargic, or if you've got somebody depressed, or if you've got somebody who's worried, or if you've got somebody who's totally nervous, and, and they're, um, the best thing that person could do is to say, I'm very nervous right now because I've not done this, and I'm going to be doing my best today, but you know, forgive me if I'm, I'm nervous or whatever. Just honesty in your face is going to go a long way, and, I, and this is what my daughter said, her first online class at, at Tufts the other day, she said it, it was incredible because she was anticipating like total and utter disaster, but the teacher was totally honest. I've never done this before. In fact, I'm not crazy about this. In fact, I've always been against this because I didn't think it was going to work, but I'm going to do my best and I hope you guys are going to do your best and let's see what happens. And it was, she said, the best class she had had all semester. <laughs> and so, then I talked to another person who told, who's, a, who's also at heart at uh, doing the extension school. And she said the same thing. The teacher was primed to not only set up the class online, but to um, walk in to say, I want to ask you what questions you have. I want you to watch this short video and then come and tell me what questions you have and let's start with that. That was the only homework they were given. And she said it was the best class we had all semester. So I have great faith that this is going to catalyze, catalyze a lot of good or better teaching. But the thing about social contagion is real, but most teachers don't even think they have that effect on anybody else. Anybody in this room can drive social contagion. Anybody can turn the mood around, anybody. But if the teacher understands they have a particular power, because they get the mic most or whatever, I mean, they, they have to understand that they can use that, they can leverage that. And it's your face, it's your tone of voice, it's how you choose to interact with people. All of those things are important, but we don't realize that power. And I think telling teachers, you know, you got that power. You can make people feel like this is the, the worst thing ever because you hate it and just say that. And then everything goes from downhill. Or you can say, I'm nervous and I'm gonna try. And it will make all the difference in the world. That honesty makes all the difference in the world. So social contagion is real. It's a very big deal, but most teachers don't even realize the power of that online. So anyways, um, that's the second to the last point. I just wanted to bring up other, um, one last thing is, is about being online and documentation. We have an unprecedented amount of data. When you guys said you know and talk to your classmates more, you guys will have, I think we documented it, I think it's more than 6,000 conversations in this class, <laughs> which is like unheard of between the number of discussion boards exchanges, because most of you are told respond and respond to two other people. So theoretically you've had two conversations. Most of you do more than two, right? So every single week for 15 weeks, you have, you know, all of these conversations, plus you do the three, two, ones, you have all these other things. We've able, you're able to document your learning in a way that's unprecedented using um, the Canvas platform and using Zoom. We can also see, oh, that's the other thing. Use the chat to take role. Um, sometimes if you, if you care about attendance or you care about those things, at the very beginning, just throw out a quick question. So, you know, how many of you can hear me? Just write yes in the chat if you can hear me. You can, you can just do something as simple as that but it registers their name and we, can, we know who was there, right? So you can use that to, to get away from all those other silly things. Right. right, and that same point is that we don't know of a way to check attendance outside of that doing that. If you go back to the recording of well, Zoom, we can't see who was there, right? You can look at the image, you can look at the but you can't say these people logged into that call. There's no call log. I wonder percent. if there's a setting in the Zoom backend, like where we select breakout rooms and other things, where we can get like a list of I don't of think that I, I'm not even going to worry about that because I have, our time is better spent doing other things. Yeah. I, when I do the three, two, ones, 
I, I remember who was in the class and I know, and if they've done the three, two, one, that's how I know they were there. And I know who isn't there because that goes automatically to the grade book. So we can see over time who has been, who's completed the work in that sense. But um, I don't know, I, I guess I, you guys are all adults. People choose what classes they go to and I could care less about that kind of participation. I care about the quality of interaction and those are unforgettable. Those are unforgettable to me. You know, when somebody says X or when somebody, you know, has this idea, that's, that's there. And I see that we record that very well. So it's not just showing up, it's the quality of your participation. And that's what gets, you know, graded in our class. So, okay. So that was all I, I was thinking about. Um, there may be other things that you guys want to ask and then we're super happy to, we don't claim to be experts and we're still learning a lot, but we have a great support team. Um, within Harvard. So if there was some technical question you wanted to ask, we can certainly get answers that, you know, if there was something uh, other than what we've shared right now. But um, I, I have to say, I love, I love this platform. I love Zoom. I think it's, uh, it works really well. Um, and we luckily have had really great experiences with it so far. So, and Tabitha, I'm not sure, did you say why you were doing this? I mean, is this just to, to to make sure your teachers are on their game or is this because you want to do this or what? <laughs> Why are you doing uh, this? More I'm preparing for um, needing to do uh, job entry training via online. And so I, I want to be able to have the skill set to say, look, if um, you're concerned about hiring me, I can basically learn online and um, function in this format. Um, and also I'm trying to figure out how to bring together, you know, my family on a social platform and so I think it's I just want to be able to be comfortable with this technology and um, so yeah that's what I'm learning it for. Good. Are, do you have any questions about any of the like bells and whistles of, of Zoom that or, or buttons that you saw that you weren't able to figure out or the things about maximizing and minimizing screens and all this other kind of little things that are around there? I think Managing those... participants all that other stuff. <laughs> I think I'm okay on those ones. I think, um, and Amanda had brought it up, um, certain things about account types. I just checked, like I have an account through my Harvard email, but when I'm graduating in May, I'm gonna have to start looking into getting my own account. And so do you guys have much information on the various levels and the various fees, you know, coming out from yeah. somebody who's yeah, not- the, I, don't, I don't know all of the options. Um, and if there's anything having to do with a student, you know, or a recent graduate or whether you'll be able to keep your um, account. But, um, but I do know that a, a full license, my understanding to be a host is $15 a month, one five. Um, and the free um, service allows you meetings up to 40 minutes, four zero. Um, you do not, to answer Amanda's other question, um, you do not have to have an, you have to, have you have to download the app onto your computer to be able to access as a student but you don't have to have um like an account or a paid account um so if you have people that you want to share you know to join you in a zoom room and they are not zoom users they have to um set themselves up for access but they don't have to be a paying subscriber um to be able to join so, meetings and lectures <clears throat> and so, anybody Anybody like like uh, Danielle is saying, you just you just click on the uh, on the you know, the link like like um, Ali did, right? You don't have to have any account set up at all, and that's free. But the thing is that after forty minutes, it cuts you off. If you want to have any other kind of uh, account where um, you're able to do recording and that it doesn't cut you off after forty minutes or whatever, then you have to go to the the pro thing. So are there other questions? Um, Victoria, Miriam, did you have other things that were on your mind? I don't know, Amanda, are you feeling good about your class tomorrow? Yeah. Um, I have yes, a question. Victoria? Yeah, go ahead, Victoria, then Amanda. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, students' analytics. So um, do you find, any, do you have it? And do you find any metrics useful? Maybe uh where students spend most of the time uh where they click most or what's maybe some sections are not being used do you have this user experience yeah we have it but we actually use more um the analytics in canvas because mo what most people don't realize when you're going online you need the platform 
So it can be Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard, whatever the, the platform is. And you have the teleconferencing. Some of the platforms like Blackboard are the teleconferencing as well, right? So you have, you, you might need two tools or you might just need one tool or whatever. We find, at least I find most useful, the analytics that are in Canvas because um, Zoom is just gonna tell us if you uh, hyperlinked to the video or whatever it is, or we could look at the individual URLs. We, we can look at, sorry, the your user number, like from what computer logs on to our thing at what point. It doesn't give me that much information. I like to look at the at Canvas at our, we have a big analytics page. I know that you guys can't see it, but we can see it. So it tells us how many minutes each of you spent on each page. Like we know exactly which page you opened and which page you stayed on or, or you know, and then if it's open all night, we know that that was an accident. It wasn't that you were really doing anything <laughs> or whatever. We can see how many times you took each quiz or what you got on each quiz. Those are things that are much more interesting to us um than just you know which computers logged on to zoom so but i would say that um if you are talking about moving and expanding this into another uh, space in in russia i would definitely look for a platform that did have student analytics but i would not marry yourself to the analytics because they can be very deceiving um you know you could say oh my gosh this person's in, spent you know uh, just this one only spent 34 hours um, looking at the bundles and this person spent 300 hours looking at the bundles. It doesn't mean they've read anything. So it doesn't prove anything. It just shows which page they visited, but the quizzes are cool. The average person took the quiz 2.4 times. The scores went up by this much. I mean, so we can recommend you should take it more than once. It's you generally to do better. I mean, there's things that are, you know, good to know and there's things that aren't that useful. So just, uh, yeah, if you're going to go for analytics, I don't think Zoom's analytics are necessarily the most informative for those kind of things. Um, they're great, but they're not what we use it for. So, okay. Makes sense. So, yeah. And Amanda, you had a question? Um, yeah. So it's kind of a part, a part A and a part B. So I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. I'm going to be sending um, an announcement. I have 15 students and I have three classes. So uh, I'm going to be sending an announcement so that um, I can meet with my students if they can. It'll be like a voluntary thing. So out of 15 students, I'm hoping to at least get maybe five students to meet um, and record and then have it available for some of the other students. Does that make sense? But then kind of give an optional another time like you do for the, um, for the submissions. So I guess my question is, um, when, when we meet, like I meet with session one, those five students, um, and do check-in and whatnot, should, should like my assignment or I'm going to use it like an, I don't know, maybe an icebreaker or whatever for the second session be different? Kind of like what you do. I never, when I'm present, does that make sense? Well, I think that there's two different things going on. It depends, and everything, everything in education depends on the objective, right? So if your objective is an icebreaker, it doesn't serve to film the icebreaker for other people because what you okay. want is people to be with people, okay. which is why in our first group, I think what we did the very first day, remember we put you into breakout rooms just so that people understood that there's such a thing. And we had you tell two truths and a lie or something yeah. like that, which was just to sort of get you guys to right. to talk to each other and actually see the functionality of the chat of, of the it breakout wasn't rooms, filmed, right? right? The breakout rooms are not no. filmed. No, okay. no. Okay. okay. But the other thing you're getting at, if the objective is to to go hopefully by flipping the class, we allow you to have a deep dive into information. So you watch the video on everything there is to know about memory. You, you watch a, an hour of understanding what a typical lecture would be. Then you come to the class with all the questions that came to your mind while you were watching that video and we deep dive into specific questions, right? So it's, it's a different objective. Is, for us, it's to be able to go deeper into the material. Um, and to have it be student centered. It's based on your questions. It's not, not what I want to make sure you know. Uh, you know, that's on the video, and that's, and usually when you choose what you record and flip, all, all learning is 
Knowledge, skills, or attitudes, okay? Knowledge are dates, facts, formulas, concepts, Googleable things, okay? The formula, the math formula, the, the date in history, you know, so theories, those are Googleable things, that's knowledge. What else do we teach? Skills, how do you apply the knowledge? And the last thing that's most important to me, at least, is, is attitudes, uh, values. Do you value uh, teamwork? Do you value the idea that you're, you know, uh, that perseverance counts for something? Do you value, um, are you empathetic to your classmates? Are you, you know, so knowledge, skills, and attitudes, okay? Now, the deal is, when you're trying to think, what do I put on this recording? What am I supposed to do if I'm going to flip? To me, the key thing is to put all the Googleable stuff, put the knowledge stuff, put the dates, facts, formulas, put the names of the theories, mention all that other stuff so that when we're in class together, we work on developing skills and changing attitudes. Most of, I mean, that's the hardest and longest part of learning. People can learn knowledge things really fast. You can learn knowledge. That's why you can go to a conference and somebody spews knowledge at you, easy. But to me, why didn't they just record that so that when I come to the conference, I can now say, yeah, but does that really work with middle school kids or is that only things for adults? Or does that you know, really also apply in the American context if that was something you're bringing from France or whatever it is, right? So to dig deeper. So when you're, so depending on the objective, okay. you have to, you decide if you're going to record and flip and use that for either the pre-teaching or what you were saying is to document that meeting so that other people could watch it and learn from that meeting. So, so now, this that's, a totally, that's totally different. We have the pre-class videos, right. the flipped ones. Right. Then we record the live class sections, which can be rewatched, and they all have a different purpose. Right. They all have a different objective. So I have like class A and class B, 15 kids in each, which is the same content. So I can use the pre-recording for both of for them. For both. But right. um, keep the two A and B like interactions separate, like different classes. Because well, why do you need to do that? I don't know, like that in my mind, I'm trying to figure out the schema of how I'm going to organize it because I want to keep the, the groups together, their cohorts A, one cohort, and then cohort B, another cohort. Like, for example, like cohort A, it, their stuff is due like on Saturday by 11.59 and cohort B, their stuff is due on Sunday by 11.59. I don't have to keep them separate, but on the grade book and on the class, they're separate. Because we well, only before, before, the first question you should always ask is why? If there is no good logic there, I have no idea why you have two different cohorts of 15 people when it might be a richer experience to have one cohort of 30 people and then divide into smaller groups when you have specific things. I think things in real do. class time, there were you know, 15 to one for class size instruction. Do you know what I mean? For teaching wise in real life, 15 to one. So that's why I think they were broken out. Um, smaller classes. There's, there's, there's three, there's a ratio, it's one to one to one. For every hour you like you're in front of the class, you should be sure that you have one hour to prepare for that and one hour to evaluate it. Now, if you are talking about putting all those 30 people together, then it's a very interesting thing that you're, you're talking about because the evaluation obviously is where you need more time um, because the preparation and the presentation are identical. So maybe by putting them together in those two, that other space, you give yourself more time for the other thing. I don't know. But um, anyways, it helps. The division, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, think, think about, you know, what is the object? Why are you doing it like that <laughs> before you just accept? Because right now this is the moment to change everything because right now everything in education is in question. <laughs> so if they've okay. divided them into two cohorts and there was, was there a purpose to that? So, I mean, so in the class, yeah, in the class, um, you know, they, they're, the private school prides itself in small class sizes. So um, 15 students to one teacher. So I have, you know, I have two sections of the same, which I'm glad because, you know, it's two sections and, you know, different, you know, characteristics. You know, some, some students in the class are kind of more like looking to apply for law school, whereas others are looking kind of more into um, like um, customs, border patrol, um, police officers, you know, so I don't know. I didn't set it up that way. 
just so that you know, that makes it easier on you, but it doesn't necessarily make it better for them. Okay. Just, just remember that. Just question everything. I think the way that we divide kids up by their abilities or uh, this group is going to be, you know, is aiming for this or that or the other thing. It's not necessarily the, the best way to get the best out of everybody. So. Okay. Thank okay, you. So going back to anything technical, is there anything technical that you want to clarify, Victoria, Ale, Miriam, is there anything that's loose end or do you think that there's anything, Danielle, we need to share? Go ahead, Miriam. This may be the dumbest question on earth, but I'm coming to this with a tabula rasa, so to speak. <laughs> it's like totally. Um, so I have a prepared set of slides that Ali can tell you that, that I showed at the class. And uh, so um, I will have either them read it or I'll read it and then have the class discuss it. I sort of on the class, like, I don't know if anybody remembers the TV show House, where we sit and we discuss each thing and each one. And how do I, if they're pre-prepared slides, how do I connect that with Zoom? I, I mean, I, I total, I, it might be the dumbest question on earth, but I really don't know what, where I'm coming with that. You can, you can do, remember I told you there's multiple levels of doing remote and online learning. And so a lot of people, their first steps, baby steps is let's, let me just take what I've done forever in face to face and let me just find a way to do it in the modality online. Yes. So, and that I think is, is missing a lot of opportunities because what I would recommend you do, but I don't know that it's comfortable because it's not a comfortable space. Everything that changes is hard, but I'm terrified. To, I am absolutely terrified. Well, so here's because right now I have a pretty good reputation and I don't want to completely ruin it and say, oh, she's miserable, don't take her class. <laughs> no, it won't be that way at all. Because one of the things that you could very well do that I think would just, it is, most teachers don't do it because it really means upping your game. And if you don't know your topic, you can't do it. But I don't think that's your sure. problem. The, the main thing would be to record the way that you would, you would talk about this slide. And so we know this slide and we know this other side. And you've had that pre-recorded. But what you're going to do then is what you have been doing. You're taking advantage of the time in class to have that discussion. But what you're doing is you're giving them even more time to prepare because you're saying, watch this beforehand and then come to class with specific questions. Wow. I have questions and you have questions. Okay. But you're giving them enough time that they can re they can listen to that twice. They can see what you said. <laughs> they get better. They get deeper questions. And then you have that discussion in class around, you can, do, you can do what you did before, but I promise you it will be better because they will have had more time to give it a better thought. But you can do that because you know your subject inside and out. Many teachers are terrified because the only thing they can do is what they can do on their slides. They have never gone beyond that. Nobody's ever challenged them. And that's exactly what this format does. When you flip it, you, you are so vulnerable to the, anything. People can ask you anything. anything and if you don't know what prepared. you're talking about, yeah. you know, you're stuck. You're really stuck. And the only thing you can definitely do that in that moment, if you don't know, is to say, great question. I don't know. Let's look for that answer together. But because you're on the spot. And that's why a lot of teachers do not flip. They don't. Because it is a much deeper way to think about the subject area. It's harder. It's much harder. Um, but it's much more fun. It's much more... This is why our class is never the same every year because all of you are different every year and you bring something totally different to the class every year. That's why this class is, is so interesting. If it was the same thing over and over, I mean, how boring for all of us. Sorry, Marian, Daniel, I think you ought to send a note to your classmates in this class because they all know how to use Zoom. They all have been online and say, if anyone would be willing to give me, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes so that I can practice with real students in a room and you can tell me what worked and what didn't. I, I, the worst is they tell you no, but I think people will help you out. That's, That's a, good a great advice. way to practice. Yeah. Go ahead, Ale. Yes, I have a question for Tracy. Um, uh -huh. So seeing that if we were to pilot something like this online instruction for new grads, what would you be uh, recommending to initiate? Um, how many um, students to have? in a platform like this? To we have managed, it depends on how much help you're gonna get and depends on what your objectives are. 
if the objective this is, sorry like one instructor like one person to how many ratio would you think just yeah, to I'm also. Right. so so here let's let's also go back remember i said that all learning is knowledge skills and attitudes all of it right mm -hmm. if the only thing your class was doing is an introduction to biology which is a ton of knowledge mm -hmm. very little skills unless you're teaching them how to use a microscope or something, but, but very little skills. And basically you could care less if, you've, if you change them in attitudes and convince them that teamwork is good or that they should have perseverance or, but maybe it is an issue. Here's what we've figured out and, and doing, we've researched this for about seven years. If all you're doing is knowledge, you can do that in a matter of hours mm -hmm. it, and, it's, and you can do it with the masses. MOOCs can transmit knowledge. They cannot, they cannot um, convert attitudes. And we found that at a minimum, it takes about eight weeks of at least some kind of contact. If we are with our students two hours a week for 15 weeks, we are pretty sure we get some movement on attitudes and, and just values. And people start to shift things that they've, they've believed for a long time, they start to shift. And it takes a minimum of eight weeks uh, and we've seen it happen. If you have less than eight weeks of contact, yeah. less than you do not change attitudes. If you if you're trying, if part of the attitude you're trying to get them is that they have to have empathy for where the patient is at, but they must have uh, a very evidence-based, subjective understanding of how to treat them or whatever. If you're trying to instill that, and you've got somebody who has no empathy and they're totally technically fabulous, if you are trying to convert that person into being a good nurse who will be able to have that empathy you won't get that in less than eight weeks. It's a very interesting process. We've experimented with formats that have gone for a week, two weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six, six weeks, eight weeks seems to be the point where we can actually get change. But then after that, 10 uh -huh. weeks and onward, you're pretty sure that the, the, the majority of the people will change attitudes. So it's not just knowledge, not just skills, but you start to see attitudinal shifts. In which is it's a fascinating thing to to watch but that's why i say it depends on your objective if your objective is only how do you draw blood okay mm -hmm. you can have one person and a thousand students and you can do it in an hour so it depends on your objective in our class we have found you're absolutely right amanda is giving you this ratio of one to 15 more or less mm -hmm. we have begged and because we were experimental at the beginning five years ago they gave us two tas for 40 people and they pretty much maintained giving us two TAs every single time. We have the luxury of having many people and that mm -hmm. makes a big difference to being able to attend to the class well. So I think Miriam will agree that having this number of TAs is a luxury for most yeah. classes don't have many it people. Is. I would say it depends on your objective, Ali. If it's just knowledge, you can have thousands of people and one, t one person. If you're trying to do something more substantial, um, I like uh, Amanda's ratio of like one to 15, one to 20. So, so one of the things that um, I learned about our class is that um, the writing, I feel like when students write their assignments and their peers are going to read it, their writing is at much higher quality, even if it's shorter. You're right. But if you just submit an assignment to me that's, you know, five pages, um, especially now with it being their schedule has changed and all these things. So now I'm getting, you know, a lot of, a lot of questions about, um, you know, extending deadlines and all that, and, which I'm happy to do, but I would rather just have them have short writing, like on discussion board and have peers um, go ahead and, and give them feedback. Then I think then write something long. Gotcha. It's, it's a great idea because when it's out there in the public eye, it, it is theoretically it's a, it's scrutinized a, by more eyes, but also that person should care more. Um, but it sometimes happens. Um, you're absolutely right. It depends on what your objective is in our class. The, the, the writing is a form of thinking thing is why we, you have more than 90 assignments in our class. I don't know if you know that, but between the three, two ones, the discussion boards, the responses and the submissions, but because there's so many of them, they count for very little each one. Each one is, you know, less than a percent, you know, it's, it's a small amount of weight towards the total grade, which actually ends up meaning that you could make a lot of mistakes and still do great in the class, right? And so 
it depends on how you want to organize it. I don't know, um, in, Danielle, in your experience with other classes of having uh, the discussion boards and all this other stuff, most classes do not milk the discussion boards as well. Um, in, and they tolerate people saying like, nice answer, or I agree, or, you know, mm -hmm. um, it depends on your objective. For us, we know that writing is a form of thinking. So the more they write, the better they're thinking. And it's hard. And, and, um, and we are, we're, we're tough on so many elements of the writing. It's not just the quality of your thought, but also can you synthesize and write within that time, you know, the number of words and all that stuff. If that's not your objective, then you don't have to have discussion boards that look like that. But so, um, so Tracy, can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Um, so one of, I think the major things I'm encountering right now at my site is at my school is that um, we haven't done a really a good enough job or a thorough enough job with like the whole APA format. So these longer papers really, once they go through this thing called turn it in is the longer papers are really just, you know, copied and pasted information um, that they're quoting somewhat, but I mean, it's just not, we haven't done a good enough job with the whole APA explaining it and how to cite. Therefore, um, the longer papers are not very, they're not really, they're just doing the knowledge, but the skills and the attitude, it's just, it's not there. Does that make sense? So, yeah, well, there's a lot of, we write, teaching writing is very, very hard. I don't know if I told you that we're working on a new program called Think Right uh, MBE. It has to do with um, different stages of thinking and writing. If you wanted, I bet I could convince somebody who's co-authoring that with me. He's a teacher in Missouri. He teaches um, English in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And he, we've been discovering a lot of really cool things about the stages of writing mm -hmm. uh, in that. And he, um, I'm sure he would be very happy to, to maybe talk to you guys or talk to the students about some hints. That's the other reason Cynthia is also with us. She loves APA. I joke with her about that, but she seriously ordered them in my last trip. She said, I will order two, but you need to read it and I need to read it. And I'm like, Bleh. but the thing about understanding the rules is one thing, but and knowing how to apply them is another thing, but it takes rehearsal and practice. And that's the only way people get better is just doing it, really doing it. I, I Amanda, okay. this is like a little tiny thing, but I think, um, you know, in APA, basically they say you shouldn't use a quote. You, shouldn't, you, should, you should paraphrase wherever possible and cite it, unless the way that those words are you know, put together conveys the idea in such a way that you really cannot do a better job, you know, unless there's like a fundamental reason that you need that quote, or it's like such a seminal work that you need a quote or whatever. Right. And so I almost wonder in the case of these students, if it would be worth artificially saying, like, you know, tell them that, but also like, you're not allowed to use more than... 40 Two words quotes or, or yeah. something or yeah. this many words per paper just for a period of time to see if it forces them to learn to um, think about what they're reading and how they can synthesize that because it's so much easier just to slap a quote into something. Right, right. And you so the other, the other big thing is, is I, I think I shared with Tracy before the class started that a lot of my students... Um, you know, they were bartenders, they had all these other jobs, like as a restaurant, in a restaurant, full-time jobs, but now that they closed because of COVID, they're now doing Uber or they're doing other type of delivery jobs to, you know, to make a living for themselves and some of them for their families. And so I think now more than ever, our students have, under, have, a, have a stronger understanding of why they need a BA, right? You know, <laughs> for a career, for a career. So they're not just kind of you know, copy and pasting and putting crap together in these five page papers. But I mean, I, I don't know that we need five page papers. If they can really synthesize what they're doing in a discussion board and get feedback from their peers, that to me is much more effective than me just, you know, getting, you know, five page papers that, you know, the hyperlinks are on the, you know, reference and, you know, all these things that they, they're not changing it. You know, they're not going back and fixing it. So when I get the next paper, there's still hyperlinks. I don't know that they're reading the feedback or, you I know. think that you also have to, again, it goes back to the objective. What is the goal here? If your goal is to get them to think, um, yeah, they need to do, you know, longer things and more research and all the rest of it and learn how to do this format. If the goal is communication, then doing these shorter things might be uh, good. I think the only thing that is, I think there's a one big piece missing from this conversation, and that is people don't magically get better just because they've written a lot. The role of feedback is absolutely fundamental. And I think 
one of the main reasons that a lot of people haven't become good writers, at least as children, is because they were never told how to get better. And what's fascinating, one of the things that we've done in the research with um, Chris, Chris found this thing stunning. He, inter he interviewed his 11th graders and he said, I'm just going to ask them what they need from me and I'm going to listen. And he had, gave every single student 20 minutes and every single student, by the time they were in 11th grade, they were really clear. Well, I'm told I ramble a bit and I don't have enough structure in my work and I need to plan better because I never really use an outline. I mean, they knew themselves, right? Another would say, I'm told I, I just really talk off the cuff and I just don't do enough research before I actually start to write. And, you know, I know I have to do that a lot better, but I just don't know how to do it, right? So every single person he talked to nailed their own problem. They, they knew what they didn't do right to write well, but they just didn't know how to write better. They didn't know how to fill in that void, that gap. And so the, the bigger role here is in how much feedback you're willing to give. Um, and this, we spend an inordinate amount of time giving feedback. And that's why we think people get better at the writing. I don't know if you've got the time to do that and if that's really your goal, because, but we think it helps people learn how to think. When we challenge them and they say, you know, not sure. If you say, this means that, and well, this in that sentence could mean these three th things. Do you understand that as a reader, I'm not following you, I'm not inside your head, I don't know what you meant by that indefinite article, please avoid those and try to be more specific. Unless I tell you what you need to do, it's very hard to get better at it, right? So unless you have the time to give a lot of feedback, uh, no matter how many writing assignments you give them, if you're not co nudging them to do it better, they're not gonna get better. So you do have to, you're gonna have to decide how much time you have to be able to do that. That's why teachers typically, one essay at the end of the semester or here's your final project or whatever, it's because that's the time they're gonna give it to it. They're gonna glance over it, okay, A, B, and nobody's gonna be around to get it back or get feedback and they're not gonna learn from it. That's not the objective of our class, which is right. why we do things. So you don't have to do it to the extreme of our class, but you don't have to do it to the extreme of how right. people take right. it. Amanda, right. it reminds me of you told me the paper you did for that one class at the end of the term. Yeah. You, it was like a 15 page paper or something and yeah. you got like two comments. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I do know that the longer you get, you know, the further along you get in some cases, it's like, you know, but it just seems like a shame. You spent an entire term, yeah. you're a graduate student, yeah. you have a doctorate in education, you want more than just like, well done. Right, right, right. Um, and, and so I, I guess that's kind of what I'm coming to because, because, because I teach online, it's already, the classes have already kind of been shaped, if you know what I mean. And it seems like there's already like points assigned for this and points assigned for that. But now because of what's happened, I feel like I have some flexibility and latitude um, to, um, and right now, honestly, I do have the time because our schools, um, you know, San Diego Unified School District is closed until May 1st. So I do have more time to invest in my students at the university level. So, um, you know, I feel like I can be a little bit. Can I cut you off for just a second? Thanks, Drew. Yeah. If you have to jump off, and thank you for for coming in. You didn't. You didn't have to. You didn't have to be here. And uh, and it's. I deeply appreciate you guys showing up, Danielle, Drew. That you didn't. Uh, it's an extra plus to have you guys here with all your good additions. Okay. Well, it's a learning experience for me, and and you all take care. And um, Ale, be, you know, be be well, and 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 uh, you're doing the good work. And um, uh, we'll talk soon. And have a good night. 007. <laughs> I like him. I like him. Almost three. I also have to get going, but I wanted to thank everyone, and I really hope to um, hopefully join you very on another occasion. Amanda and yes. Tracy and Drew, you guys are great. Oh, thank you. Thank You're you. great. And if you have any additional questions, just uh, go ahead and email and let us know if there's any other things that you had. Um, it's we're we're happy to support you when you move to doing stuff online. Yep. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.